uh, begin at so we'll wait just another moment uh, for anyone to join who uh, is planning on joining us today. Um, and in just a moment, I will introduce Dr. Ken McCoy. Professor Ken McCoy. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, today we have two uh, speakers, uh, Ken McCoy and Hunter Murphy, both of whom I'll introduce in uh, just a few moments. And I just wanted to mention briefly that we are playing with new formats for this session. Uh, we're not gonna engage those formats today, but as we look into the future for the series, um, we are going to attempt to pair folks with discussants um, uh, to aid in conversation. Today I'll play that role by um, helping moderate questions and uh, by asking some of my own if I get the opportunity to do so since I get the privilege of listening to these presentations. Uh, but today we will uh, follow a typical format in which um, uh, Professor McCoy will go first. I'll ask that he keep his remarks to about 20 minutes. Uh, we'll go to Q&A. Um, and then we'll turn um, to Hunter Murphy's presentation um, right around uh, 12.35. Um, I'll try to keep it close to there, uh, definitely before 12.40. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions as, for him as well. Um, so first I'd like to introduce uh, Professor of Theater Arts, Kenneth McCoy. He has been at Stetson for 27 years and he teaches all aspects of theater, including this semester, I've heard, uh, a course on uh, acting comedy, which I would very much like to take. Um, but I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from him today. He'll be presenting on his project, Becoming Cherokee. Um, and Hunter, I'll introduce you actually just prior to your presentation. Um, so uh, Kenneth, take it away. Okay, hey everybody, I'm Ken. Um, this, uh, I wrote a play, I guess. The title of the play is Becoming Cherokee. And that's pretty much what I did on my sabbatical. Um, this presentation is focused on the process and results of that sabbatical. It was in fall of 2019. And the title of the proposal was Liminality, Diaspora, and the Performance of Identity in Native America. And its purpose was to conduct academic and field research into these aspects of Native American identity and then to utilize those results to author a dramatic work. I've directed over 50 plays for the stage and have done uh, almost as much in, in acting for, for stage and camera. But I've never written anything until now, so this would be my first effort at playwriting. Uh, this represents an area of expansion and growth uh, for me. And uh, as an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation, I decided to start with my own tribe. I was originally inspired by a statement by Spokane and Coeur d'Alene writer Sherman Alexi Jr., who in an interview with Bill Moyers described himself as being perceived as ambiguously ethnic, an indigenous immigrant who tries to live in the in-between in modern American life. I took that as a statement on how indigenous Americans have been so heavily stereotyped, especially by film and television, that those who choose not to wear long hair or dress in 19th century plains Indians feathers, they can be hard to pick out in a crowd. Uh, to assert their identity as indigenous, a modern person must make an effort to perform their indigeneity. Not performance as it might suggest artificiality, but in the sense of doing, uh, and in an honest and accurate way that counteracts that stereotyping with truthful activity. This performance of identity and culture has been the focus of a junior seminar course that I've offered for the past eight years or so, uh, and which was the subject of a previous sabbatical in 2012. So I felt as a creative artist directing theater and a person with indigenous ancestry, I should make my own contribution in this area. I'd originally planned to gather enough interview material to write a work of what is now called verbatim theater in which numerous subjects' own words and quotes are edited together as dramatic text. The plan was to build on my experience as a director and make putting together a performance script more a matter of editing than of playwriting. I have not yet written that work. Uh, I expect to continue working on something like it. I changed gears a little bit. 
And I wrote something different because as I began, I ran into a couple of views uh, that ended up giving me the courage to see myself less as an editing director and more as an author. Uh, one is I wanted to get genuine reactions and beliefs. And I felt like if I tried to maintain a posture, an objective academic, which is the usual thing we do, I was afraid I would be the subject of distrust and not get the kind of candid responses that I wanted. There is a lot of distrust of the academy in Indian country. Uh, it was my intention to write as an insider rather than as an, as an outsider, and it just didn't seem like the way to do it. And the other thing is that I began to hear similar statements over and over from many Cherokee, especially those at-large people who, like me, enrolled in the tribe uh, from outside of Oklahoma. As a verbatim work, then, it would probably be pretty short because they're it was just very repetitive. People were all saying the same things or the same kinds of things. Um, but I began to see how I could tell the story in a more engaging way. It would be less like a lecture and more like an entertaining story. And in the end, I had more developed ideas about writing a play than I did about editing together. So the news asserted itself, and I ended up writing a play. Uh, I ended up with a work of dramatic fiction within which I introduce some of those common themes and issues that are at the center of Cherokee identity, um, especially for those like me who came kind of came to the table late, but were still welcomed as a full-fledged member of the community. In that sense, it's somewhat autobiographical. It also includes what I've learned from others. Much of the information presented in the play is representative of the first things that a new citizen is made aware of. And I begin to target that group a bit as a, as a prospective audience as I was writing. Um, as a liminalized people in diaspora, there are some good historical reasons why Cherokee were not automatically tracked and enrolled in, in tribal role. And I touch on some of that shared history in the play and in its impact on culture. So here are some of those elements I found that contribute to Cherokee identity. At the top of the list is what you might know as the Trail of Tears. The forcification of an entire people from largely Georgia, Alabama, and some of Tennessee and North Carolina, all the way across the Mississippi River, first into Arkansas, and then later into what is now Oklahoma, which at the time was called Indian Territory. Um, that is still a sore spot, much discussed, studied, and debated amongst scholars and uh, Cherokee scholars included. It has fostered a more widespread knowledge of tribal and family history within uh, the citizenship at large. Another is the Cherokee language, which is fast disappearing as a first language, as its speakers are growing old, passing on. So there are a lot of initiatives in place to keep the language alive in both spoken and written form. And just as a sideline, you may not you may have heard of Sequoia, uh, who invented a written language for the Cherokee, not being or speaking any other language. Uh, an achievement there. Uh, spirituality is for the lives of many. For many, it's Christian. For some, it's non-Christian, and for some curious blend. Uh, this includes traditional stories and folklore that are commonly shared at gatherings. Um, I'm sorry, traditional food is also uh, at small and large. Living as an indigenous person in the modern world always and does have an impact on individual collective identity. And finally, as with most indigenous, connection to the land on which they live is very important. Uh, and in some ways, the land of Oklahoma has been replaced or have been added to the land that they were ejected from back east as a focus of identity. And my play treats land inheritance as a focus of the conflict and as a vehicle for examining these other issues. So I focused on three issues that were related to land and residence uh, that have an impact on their present culture. You might think of them as three moments in history. One is the Trail of Tears. The other is land allotment. 
And for those of you who don't know what land allotment is, right about the time that uh, Oklahoma became a state, um, the communally held tribal lands were divided up and allotted to individuals according to numerous rules that were set by Congress. Um, this did not only happen within the Cherokee Nation or within the other uh, uh, tribes that were located within Indian Territory, but also uh, it was attempted with some tribes that in other parts of the United States, almost always to the detriment of those tribes. Um, obviously, there was a lot of land left over, which then could be uh, auctioned off or otherwise distributed to white settlement. And uh, so the state that was going to be Indian territory became an amalgam of uh, native and, and white, mostly white populations. Uh, then there was the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, which lasted for about 30 years into the 1980s. It was a vocational job training program, uh, and somewhat ironic, after expending all this effort to get Indians to settle in particular places, they then expended a lot of effort to get them to leave and break their connection to their lands, uh, encouraging them to move to urban centers. Uh, and other places where they could be trained for jobs and assimilate into American mainstream culture. Um, this included, you know, New York, Minneapolis, Chicago, uh, and various places in California. Most Cherokee historically migrated to California at some point. So that uh, at present, I think, as of the 2010 census, uh, the Cherokee were the most popular, populous tribe in California, including those that were native to California. So here's a brief synopsis of my play. Two brothers from California inherit 140 acres of land in Oklahoma from their recently deceased great-grandfather, who they never knew. This is said in the present. Brother Richard wants to cash it in immediately. The other, Alex, who is a ceramic artist, wants to camp out a bit or an old rickety log cabin and feel it out some. He discovers Cherokee relatives living nearby and he wonders why he and Richard inherited the land and not one of them. Upon getting to know them, they introduce him to Cherokee culture and his own family history. Alex considers repairing the cabin to make it livable. He resists the land sale when his brother shows up with his wife, Rebecca, and conflict ensues between them that spreads among the other characters as well. Along the way, various elements of Cherokee culture are woven into the play's action, including language, history, folklore. Without giving too much away, the brothers find a way to resolve their differences. The cabin is renovated. A note from their great-grandfather is discovered in the cabin that explains his reasoning for leaving the land to the two brothers instead of his more immediate kin. So I think I, I can do this in six minutes. Uh, I'd like to read you the first scene of the play which serves to kind of set the scenes before the brothers arrive. Uh, so I will move to that. This is Becoming Cherokee, a play by me. Scene one, setting. Lights up on a patch of gently rolling hills in rural northeastern Oklahoma. There's a clearing, the edge of a meadow abutting some forest. A creek nearby can be heard in the background. The one side is an old cabin out of milled logs, neglected, not good to live in. Perhaps some loose boards on the siding or porch, stone steps or paving stone. Down the stage right is a fire pit with fired pots around it. It's summer. At rise, Ellen, a grandmotherly type in a simple house dress, sits on one of two seat-sized logs or stumps before a fire pit. She tends numerous clay pieces along the edges of the low-burning fire and coals. Small plates, bowls, pots, tobacco pipes, firing them in the traditional Cherokee manner, occasionally turning them and edging them closer to the center of the fire. On stage right, Looney enters, an old man who expends as little energy as possible except occasionally when he gets excited about something. He's wearing old jeans or canvas work pants, a distressed once white cowboy hat, and a light long sleeved checkered shirt. He's carrying an over-the-shoulder canvas bag of the kind once used by newsboys from the mid-20th century. Something not too heavy is in it. He's also carrying a wooden apple crate or box. 
Ellen says, there you are. I was beginning to think you got lost on the way back from the house. Shh. You know better than that. I was born in these woods. So was I, but I've been living with you long enough to know when you are avoiding useful work. What do you mean? It was my idea to come up here and check on the cabin. One who decided to load up all that mess and make a simple look into an all-day adventure. Uni Adair, you know we get good use out of these. That light bill don't pay itself. I got my retirement. Well, it ain't enough. Besides, you need keeping an eye on. Uni starts towards the cabin. Be careful now. You're too old to be climbing around on that thing. I ain't going up on the roof. Just looking at the porch railing. Well, be careful anyway. I'm not strong enough to drag you back home if you fall off it. Uni snorts. <laughs> I don't know about that. You're still as strong as I am. It takes a measurement. There. That's it. No need to do everything all in one day. Whew. Looney sits down to take a load off. Look at the cabin a while. This place brings back memories. Or have you forgot them all along with the way up here? I told you I wasn't lost. As a matter of fact, I was making us a snack. He holds up the canvas bag. Kind of snack. Little sandwiches. Well, that's better than nothing. She smiles. Ado. Looney smiles back. Welcome. Are well, you going to make me wait? Get on with it. Yes, ma'am. Looney places the apple side down on the ground between them and sets the table with items from his bag. Eventually, he realizes the bag is empty. Ah, shoot. Ellen looks at him. I didn't bring nothing to drink. Ellen produces a stoppered clay jar from behind her. Here. When he takes the jar, unstops it, and smells. Don't get your hopes up. It ain't nothing but water. When he sips, it's cold. I just took it out of the creek. To eat? Well, this is nice. Uh-huh. You're a sweet old man. You're a nice young lady. You remember when we used to set out on that old porch swing? I do. Oh, it's, we spent some nice evenings out here on that old thing. Right up until it broke. I've been meaning to put that back together ever since. Well, don't hurry on my account. It's only been 20 years. More than that, surely. Well, that's when I stopped counting. Don't you worry, none. I'll get around to it one of these days. Pots need turning. She does. What's that one? Pipe? What's wrong with this one? He takes a clay pipe from his pocket. This one's for me. Well then, he sits back. Hmm. She finishes pots. Oh. They sit in quiet for a moment. He lights his pipe and shares it with her. The next few lines of conversation have the feeling of a ritual storytelling. Who was it built this cabin? My granddaddy. Years after his granddaddy walked over from Alabama. With his mama and daddy and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins. Some of them didn't make it. Some did. And he remembered them. And so do we. My folks was already here. And by boat and on horses, old settlers. Most made it, some didn't. More than didn't later. Didn't nobody really want to leave the old nation, whether they came early or late on their own or by force, by boat or on foot. But come they did, and then they lived here. In this cabin, my mama was born. That's what the old folks told me when I was a young girl. What you told me when I was a young man, fish in each other's arms. These are all in the colds now. We can go on back home and send Cricket to get them tomorrow. You sure you can make it back over the hill? Let's find out. She's, he starts to walk her out. Don't forget my jug. He crosses to get the jug. He puts one arm low around her waist. Let's walk out together up stage right. On the way, she lifts his arm up higher. To a more chaste level. They chuckle as the lights go out. 
And that's the end of scene one. And it gets crazy. So, Thank you. Uh, sorry, the, go ahead. Do you want to? I was going to say, I was gonna say that's it. That's a little bit of the flavor of the play, uh, you know. And uh, I read you how it, you know, how it turns out and everything. But you get a sense of you're working on pottery. There's a little bit of the language. There's a little bit of history, and everybody kind of knows what they're about to watch. They know where they are and what's going on. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I really did like hearing that rendition. It was really cool to be able to witness that. Um, so I have um, a question in the chat that I'll weave in, but I also had a sort of question that I think would be a good entree into our Q&A portion. And it relates actually to uh, Dr. Harry Price's question. Um, so your identity um, as a scholar, as a person, as an author is caught up in multiple ways in this sabbatical project. You mentioned like the classic sort of like ethnographic insider, outsider sort of problem. You know, am I a participant observer? What does that mean? Um, you mentioned the shifting like sense you had of your own identity as an editor, as someone who's collecting quotations, as an author. Um, and so I just wondered if you might say a little bit more about how your sense of your own identity shifted, if at all, across the course of writing. Um, and uh, Dr. Harry Price asks, um, can you uh, say more about how you discovered your Cherokee ancestry? Was it preserved by a family or was it known as a family legend? Um, and so similarly, uh, he's, he's wondering about identity. So if you could address um, some of these questions, we'd love to hear. Okay, first one uh, is maybe a little bit more fun to answer because I've never been asked that question before, uh, which is uh, how did I feel? How did I transform as I was writing? And the first thing that comes to my mind is I've, I began to feel as if I were a representative, as if it were testimony that I was giving almost, even though it was in the guise of characters. You know, there's this, this sweet little old lady that I've met so many times uh, amongst you know, my Cherokee cousins and, and and elsewhere in the nation. And then the crotchety old man, it's, I mean, his, his job was a welder <laughs> before he retired, uh, you know, and uh, uh, he's just perfectly fit into the world and yet still kind of has a, a handle on things and then is not overly ambitious to get going with Fixer Up projects around the house, at least on the cabin. The brothers are also kind of have a kind of split, uh, like one person split in two. The one brother is uh, all about the money, like as much money as possible. Get You know, money is the way you keep score in life. You know, this is how you know you're doing well. The other brother wants to slow down. He's a more, more of the artist. He wants to drink in. He wants to process and so on. And uh, so that, just that dynamic between those four people, there's a, there's a, a, obviously every play has some kind of young love interest. I, one of my Cherokee cousins forced me <laughs> to include that uh, aspect in the play. And uh, she serves as a kind of catalyst for him and an entry uh, and motivation for him to go a little farther. Uh, Richard's wife is straight from the Jersey Shore he met her in New York when he was in school and he brought her back to California. And so she's working real hard to fit into Cali the you know, California world and then overjoyed to find herself in the woods, you know, in the newest L.L. Bean clothing, <laughs> et, cetera, et cetera. So there's a, there are a lot of dynamics that are kind of wrapped up in that that I feel like are people that I know that I've met or that are aspects of my own personality that I'm trying to advocate for almost and putting them together and letting them interact. So my story uh, is, uh, is a strange one, uh, <laughs> but then I thought it was strange, but it turns out to be not, not so atypical. Uh, for my whole life, my grandparents told me that we were, I put it, part Indian. And that's not unusual. I grew up in Northeast Alabama, where almost everybody claims to be part Indian. So it was, no, not entirely uh, believed. 
but he apparently had spoken to my brother a little bit more about it than he did to me. And uh, I knew where he was born, of course. So one day I was poking around on the internet and I looked up Salisaw, Oklahoma, and I saw that it was right on the border of the Cherokee Nation. And lucky for me, uh, a lot of these, uh, the documents that you have to look up to trace ancestry back are now available. Like you used to have to go to the National Repository in Atlanta or somewhere and go through microfiche and spend a long time looking for things. And uh, most of that was loaded online. Uh, I believe you can search the roles now without charge. At the time, I went through uh, something that used to be called, I think it was called footnote. Com. It's now called Fold3, and it focuses on military history, but originally it was like a footnote to history kind of thing that, that had indexed all of those original roles. I looked up the Cherokee Nation and membership and found that you did not need a minimum blood quantum, number one. You just had to demonstrate descent to front, and the last opportunity to create a role before the Cherokee Nation was kind of disbanded when Oklahoma became a state, was in there were two roles: a Dawes role, which controlled allotment, and the Miller role, which was kind of the um, it was like one of the last efforts at reparations from the Trail of Tears. I guess maybe you could put it that way. But they, especially the Miller role in the application, they encouraged people to note their grandparents and cousins and anybody else that might be applying. So you found ways to build these family trees. And uh, I had to contact like the state of California for births and death certificates and so on and, and prove my legitimacy uh, to the Cherokee Nation. And so I enlisted my father and my brother and my two sisters, and we all applied in one application. And uh, it was that easy. I found out later that they're, they're really making an effort to scoop people back up because not only did people move away in this uh, Indian relocation project, but they also moved away for other reasons. And sometimes they were, and especially, uh, this is more the case for North Carolina than it is for Oklahoma, but children were forcibly removed. Well, I can't say forcibly removed, but they were strongly encouraged to give up their children for adoption. And sometimes it was not really given to them as a choice. Uh, and then those children were raised somewhere else and then then try to rejoin the tribe maybe a generation or two down the line. So that's basically how it happened. Uh, Thanks and very much for sharing that. Um, Hunter has a question that's related, um, and you've answered a little bit of it, but I just want to invite him if he'd like to um, to ask. Yes. Ken, I went to UAB, by the way. Oh, you did. And you just <laughs> said you, Yeah, and you just yeah, go Blazers. And you just said that you grew up in northeast Alabama, which I did too. Where did you grow up? I was born in Gadsden. Oh yeah. Out uh, Scottsboro. We played Gadsden. Oh, yeah. yeah. We played yeah, Gadsden. My father was born in you know the little place that used to be called Larkinsville? Of course. Yeah, that's where my father was born. Oh, that is fascinating. And so that's what I was going to ask you because, you know, Alabama history in ninth grade, I guess you, you had to take it too. You know, we, we, we talked about the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee Creek, Choctaw, um, and some of the other the tribes that were affected and victims of that horrific chapter in American history. And I wanted to ask, so, so that's where, are you basing, the play was incredible what you read. Are you basing it in like a group from Northeast Alabama or did you have another area in mind? When I, well, when I hear them speak, I hear them speak in like, in the Southern accent. Because yeah. I don't know if you know much about that area of Oklahoma too, but they they call that area that's where I'm Broken Arrow, uh, Tulsa, Fort Gibson. They call that Little Dixie because there was a pipeline of people going back and forth between specifically between Scottsboro and uh, Salisaw, especially. And I'm pretty sure they they ran liquor. 
Oh this wow! Would have been during the you know during prohibition, I'm pretty sure there was there was liquor involved. Oh, that's Some right. of my other, Yeah. I have bootleggers in the family, and <laughs> so I have some of that passed down. Well, I have drinkers, yeah. So that that's awesome, <laughs> man. What a what a great! I really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, that's the, the play is really neat. I'm looking forward to reading it. Well, I'd like to do it. We just got sidelined because of uh, COVID. We can't do yeah. shows just yet. So I really uh -huh. want to get it in the hands of actors and get it in front of an audience to give it like the final polish. Oh yeah. I had two table readings uh, with some playwrights already. So we've been through some, this is the third draft that I read to you. So wow. it's pretty much ready. So so, on, that, on that note then, Ken, I'll ask you sort of two related questions. One is um, what are your plans then for this like, what are your hopes for it? And then secondly, um, sort of relatedly, are you planning on engaging um, your Cherokee heritage in further uh, creative projects? Uh, I'll answer the second one first, because yes. Um, I do have like plans to do a sort of dramatic presentation of informative material. But I'm, I'm trying to go back and maybe do that through primary materials. There have been a lot of documentaries and other film representations of the Trail of Tears period, but it is one of the most documented uh, period, like uh, periods of removal in uh, all of Native American history. Because I don't know if you know, they took they had two cases before the Supreme Court of the United States that then went to set precedents for the way that Native American tribes have been treated ever since, and. Uh, Along the way, there are lots of newspaper articles, the congressional records, um, diaries of missionaries. It's just just a wealth of, in their own words, type of material. And so that's, I think, the verbatim theater project that I'll probably do next. Try and pull all that stuff together. Uh, what was the first question? I'm going to do with this play. Yeah, and, and you already began to answer it that you're looking for. Um, you've done some table reads and you're looking for a, a way to have the play um, done. And I was just curious if you, you know, had a preferred audience or specific hopes or goals for this uh, that you'd like to share further. Well, my, my dream would be to get it produced somewhere in, in Oklahoma, because I think it speaks, I'm hoping it speaks to that population. Um, I, like I say, I'm somewhat hampered by not being able to get it in the hands of someone. So I really need somebody to like give it a production I can see and hear. It's not just out of my own head. Um, but if worse comes to worse and these things just keep dragging out and, and it doesn't seem to be possible to get it up and running anywhere, then uh, I'll probably just start submitting it to playwriting festivals. And hopefully within a couple of years, those will be back up and running. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then I'll just invite anyone um, else who'd like uh, to unmute yourselves and ask a question um, and just sort of one final opportunity to engage uh, Ken. And I know we're all very uh, glad to have heard your presentation. Just giving one last little opportunity here. <laughs> I feel like I'm teaching at this moment. Uh, we're all so used to this strategy now, like, okay, one last chance here. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ken. That was wonderful. Very moving. Oh. Very, Is that very. Harry? Yeah, man. Oh, thanks, Harry. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'd love to sort of call to the stage, as it were, uh, Hunter Murphy. Um, and say a little bit um, to introduce him so that we can uh, hear about his project. Um, so Hunter is uh, the um, engagement and learning librarian at the DuPont Ball Library, and he was engaging in a project entitled Business-Based Information Literacy, uh, which involved developing a research guide particularly uh, focused toward uh, students in business. So um, welcome, Hunter, and uh, thank you so much for presenting, and uh, please go ahead. Okay, great. Hunter, would you mind if I share my screen? Is that possible? Go right sure. ahead. Yeah. Not at all. Please go ahead, yes. 
Okay. Let's see. Great. I see okay, I'm a, a I'm a as well, so that's good. We can see that link. Yeah. Oh, good. I need to be a moderator, I think. As a presenter, I don't think I can. I, I don't. I'm not seeing how I can share it. You are correct. Ooh, very good. Excellent. Um, good, good, good. So. Okay, one sec. Sorry. Not at all. Go ahead and take your time. Okay, good. Okay, you all, I wish I had a play for you. Uh, Dr. Ken, that was so hard to follow. I can speak in a dramatic voice if you'd like me to. I was really so impressed. But this is what I did. So, um, Grace and I, Grace Kaletsky Mazel, one of my buddies at the library, she and I teach a lot of the information literacy sessions to different classes, including um, arts and sciences, business, some music. And um, so we basically go in and teach research strategies and skills to students. And part of the, uh, our task is to um, increase the student competency in their information literacy skills and we oftentimes create these guides here this is a guide that i created for the summer grant project for the school of business administration 205 soba 205 professional communications class um and so i pretty much do this for all the business classes that i teach but part of my grant was to do a session or several sessions give the students a survey and um, right before their midterm, so I taught the class about a week or two before their midterm assignment, um, gave them a survey, and then I returned after they submitted their midterm assignment and to try to see if their perceptions changed, what was different, how they ended up using the, the resources. The professors had all assigned them um, part of their uh, a research assignment was to use five credible sources um, for their midterm, and so that's a part of the deal. So this is the guide I just wanted to show you all, and then to get to the project, so we got um, you know the different databases to use. This is what we went over in the class, and uh, search tips, what is peer review, Google versus library databases. One of the classes did uh, their midterm was on career. Uh, it was a career portfolio, so we spent a lot of time on on our career resources, uh, company and industry information, citations for the students, and then, so after I uh, presented to the class, then I, I gave them this survey. And one thing that I thought was really interesting, the people who participated, so I got over 241 survey results here. Um, and as, as Persky Lee and Lesselman said, the most appropriate use of perception of learning data is in assessing student metacognition and self-efficacy. And perceptions of, of a, another author said, perceptions of academic self-concept con formed at an early stage significantly predicted um, expected performance. So what I was interested in is, although it doesn't, measure the effectiveness of the library instruction. I wanted to see what students, how they felt about their ability to employ information literacy skills, how they would uh, change over time from after, from the time of instruction to the time of the midterm submission. And, you know, a lot of the academic literature is pretty clear that the way people feel about their own learning really affects their ability to learn so sort of their attitudes their perceptions their self-assessment if somebody feels like they can do it then there's a better chance that they can and you know the library has a lot of databases and a lot of resources we have over you know almost 300 databases we create these guides we've got hundreds of these research guides in every major and minor so uh, 
uh, sometimes navigating them can be a little bit complicated and tricky. And, and of course, the students that think that, that because they have a phone and they can search Google that, um, and I don't know, uh, Twitter, that they can, they can, it's the same thing as searching library databases, and it's not. And so it, it takes a little bit of convincing to show them, you know, you know how, how to do this effectively. And so that's, that's our jobs as teaching librarians. And so anyway, after the first survey, I wanted just to show you who participated. And probably one of the most stark uh, results was that because this was a SOBA 205 class, I was expecting a lot of sophomores. But as you can see here, the majority, 90%, we're talking first year students, right? So one thing that I realized, and because, you know, I've taught over 60 classes in, in a year and a half, and one thing that I realized in, in my first semester here teaching at Stetson's was that some of these classes I was teaching for the SOMA 205, they were the same students that I taught in the FSM classes. And so when I asked them their year and realized that they were first year as well, it made me realize that I need to not be as redundant and, and go to the same things that I'm going over in their FSM classes in the SOBA. So that was a really important um, discovery. And I kind of expected it a little bit after my first semester. I thought, oh, my God, these are the same kids. And I'm going over some of the same stuff, and I shouldn't be. So that was something that I really learned because I really did the study to, to sort of try to improve my techniques because we usually, and uh, the experience of the students, because we usually only get like an hour or two with them a semester. Um, so those are the ones who participated. Also asked them what their planned course of study or major was. For the most part, they are traditional. Uh, they are traditional business majors, management, finance and accounting, marketing, some in healthcare, STEM and political science, and then a few undecided. So I just kind of wanted to know that. So what they told me is that the librarian session did improve their skills, which guys I'm grateful for, because otherwise I would be, I would have a hard time justifying my uh, salary. So it's always interesting to see those who don't, who strongly disagree or disagree. Um, they're always in every crowd. There's one in every crowd. As you can see, there's a couple in this crowd. But for the most part, the students really got a lot out of the library session. Uh, the, the, it really, they said it improved their, their library uh, skills, their research skills. And so another thing that I wanted to study in this was the academic literature uh, a lot of librarians and researchers have, and folks in higher education, have have compl not complained. They have concluded that students in Generation Z, the ones who are in college right now, they have overconfidence in their ability to evaluate sources and do research. It kind of goes with that thing that we were talking about just a second ago, the phone in the hand. They feel like, you know, that they have all sort of the answers. They can get the answers. But finding a restaurant in your neighborhood is much different than find, finding peer-reviewed scholarship on um, the, the, the effect of Cherokee's uh, nation's um, experiences in the Trail of Tears. I mean, you know, these things are much different. Right. So, uh, of course, we're doing business sources, but that, I wanted to study their confidence and see how their confidence would be regarding the other questions that I asked in, in the, the, the survey. So, as you can see here, um, most of the students were quite confident or extremely confident in their ability to evaluate sources. Uh, a few were somewhat and very few again, or slightly or not at all confident. So as the academic literature has show, shown, they have a lot of confidence in themselves. I was glad to see that there was a lot in this middle range and not uh, that hugely uh, confident. It did. It was interesting as well that it sort of changed a little bit after the midterm. So in the, the red represents the second survey. So you can see they're actually when they started applying their research and from, you know, using the library sources and everything. And after their midterm, they actually gained confidence. And I, for me, that was encouraging. So anyway, so the importance of research skills for this class. I asked them what, uh, how, they, how important they thought the research skills were for completing the assignments in the class. And as you can see here, most of them thought they were really important. Interestingly enough, after their midterm, that 
feeling of those being important kind of decreased a little bit. Um, so I thought that was really kind of interesting. Um, one of my favorite sets of data is the Google use professors in the syllabi because I looked at all of them. I did 10 classes. These were 10 classes. And in every single one, the professor said, do not use Google. My friends, guess what they did? 50% used Google. 8% used Google <laughs> exclusively. I shouldn't laugh, but I think it's funny uh, that they did. They, they absolutely went against what the professors asked them to do. However, 43% did not use Google. So that's pretty good. This is what I asked them. I said, so if you did use Google, what or other library sources did you use in order to complete your project? And I was really grateful that they said research guides and databases. They chose that as the number one source of other things that they used in addition to Google. Because as you all know, it's really expensive for us to pay for these databases at the library. Uh, we, the librarians and I spend a lot, uh, a lot of time um, working in these databases, creating these research and course guides for the students. So I was really glad that they chose that first. And they also chose journals and magazines and research guides, some without books. Some did just journals and magazines and Google, and then some, a few with books, and then a few with books, guides, and Google. So, so for my good 43%, the students who put an apple on their professor's desk, the ones who did not use Google as they were instructed not to do, this was interesting as well. These are the sources they used when they were not those who did not use Google. Again, the number one choice was only research guides and databases. Second to that was library books, journals, magazines, and research guides and databases. And then these are pretty close library books and research guides, and then journals, research guides, and databases without books. So it was really great to see what the kids who, who didn't use Google used. And finally, when students only used one source of information to complete their research assignment, this is what we came, they came up with. Um, some of them, uh, the, the number one, again, choice was the research guides and databases. Second was books, and right there, magazines and research guides. Okay, moving right along, it's 1248. So I asked them to rank these information literacy skills, you all, and I gave them a choice. So in the library world, we have what is called the framework of information literacy, six threshold concepts, which uh, encompass all the ideas of uh, the most important ideas in higher education that the, the library teaching faculty in the library world can offer students to help them be successful in their um, in their in their academic experience and, and instead of using some of the jargony language of the framework of information literacy I kind of made it sound a little less uh, academic and I, I asked them to uh, to rank what's the, abil the ability to evaluate articles and journals and magazines for credibility, the ability to search for books and ebooks, citing sources in a paper, and then research strategies and techniques. And so for the skills they thought that they were the most important, they ranked search strategies and techniques as the most important. Now what's in orange here is the what I collected the survey results right after instruction. So in the first set, Research strategies and techniques really blew everything out of the water. Um, the other ones, citing sources in a paper, was second. Ability to search books and ebooks was fourth. And to evaluate for credibility was third. What I thought was kind of interesting is right here in the gray, after the midterm, so the second survey, show with those 122 students, they chose them pretty much ranked them um, equally important. Of course, uh, research strategies and techniques, I'm talking about search strategies, creating effective search strategies, that, that was the most important thing, but the others are pretty much uh, even right there. So, and then here, the, I, kind of, I kind of thought it was interesting to rank the, the last or to, to look at what they ranked um, the least important, and they ranked 
citing sources in a paper was fourth um, after instruction and after midterm. And so but they're, they're pretty much pretty close there. So you got the pie chart, um, right? So I know I'm going by, through this really fast, but I just want to go over a couple more things before I finish. So when they said the students reported that they had used uh, the research guides and databases the most, I kind of wanted to see if they were telling the truth. I hate to even suggest that our darling students would not tell the truth. I just kind of wanted to see what are how, what are the real numbers. For one thing, we close. I did this survey before we closed down in March, right? So I wanted to see like if that affected anything, and so it wasn't really part of my original survey, my original summer grant proposal. It, it was it hadn't have anything to do with that. But we keep statistics on how many times these guides are accessed. So as you all can see. They said that they sometimes used, sometimes or frequently used the guide, which sort of correlates with the earlier data we were just looking at. Only a few 20 students said they used it infrequently, and only eight of my precious darlings said never. These people, I think, just like to hurt my feelings, but that's okay. But here's the deal, you guys. Look at this. Here, here are the actual, here's the actual use of the course guide. The number of times students accessed the course guide through the last spring. January, 341 times. February, which is when the bulk of these sessions I taught, were 970. But here's what's a little bit encouraging. Here's COVID shutdown. You still had 39 people. And then April, when they were doing their final projects, final research, you had 126 hits. And then maybe a few stragglers there in May, so seven. So that is pretty encouraging um, to me because, again, a little that differs a little bit from my original uh, intention for this study. However, I wanted to see if they were really looking at this. Um, and finally, I promise you guys it's coming to a close, the desired skill. I wanted to ask them, after all of this, after they had turned their midterm in, I asked them a question on the second survey, which I had not asked on the first. What skill would you like to know more about? Would you like to have a better understanding of, et cetera? And I gave them these choices. Research strategies, using specific library databases, ability to search print books and eBooks, ability to find appropriate articles and journals, and citing sources in the paper. They had the option to choose either one or all that applied. Out of all the various skills and combinations they are in, the majority, 53%, included, chose research strategies and techniques. Almost half of the students chose citing sources in a paper as something to know more. 43, 34% um, of the students chose the ability to find appropriate articles and journals as something to explore more. And Using specific databases also had 34%. So I, I thought this was really interesting because we only have librarians, as I was telling you just a minute ago, we usually have one shot. We call them one shot sessions. We have an hour, um, sometimes an hour and 15 minutes, sometimes 50 minutes to get as much of this information to them as possible. Uh, the framework of the information literacy is really complicated. Um, it was published just a few years ago. Uh, created by the um, American College and Research Libraries Association, and it's great and it's wonderful and it has all these fascinating concepts and, and you want to touch as many as you can in these sessions. And since there are really only two main teaching librarians, me and Grace, Jennifer also does some, Kelly Larson does a little bit, and Jean just retired from the music as a music librarian, so we don't have many folks to do this. So trying to find the most effective the things that the students want is really important. Uh, we have a great writing center, as you all know, at Stetson. Um, and so the citing sources, they are really experts to that. We also include in all the guides, we try to, especially the course guides, we include stuff for general citations. So I definitely need to, uh, in my future guides uh, sessions, I need to go over this. Um, go over the resources of the writing center as well as 
the uh, resources that we have in the library to help them with these skills. And I actually employ some of this. My, my, going forward, I plan to improve some of my library uh, instruction sessions by uh, focusing more on the research strategies and techniques, the stuff that the kids really want. And uh, in one way, COVID is the one silver lining of this, you know, what situation of this COVID has created is we have, I've, I've been able to employ like a flipped classroom model. So instead of having one shot, I have like one and a half or two, I get the students assign them something before the, I visit the class and that improves their skills or gets them used to some of the techniques that we're talking about that I'm usually talking about in my hour long talk and um, so these are sort of the things I, I really think this this summer grant uh, project really worked for me because it gave me the uh, opportunity to study what the students felt about themselves their own self-assessments their own attitudes um, of library research and skills and uh, information literacy skills and so you know and they are the the primary user group that, that we librarians are trying to reach and so it's not like uh, I didn't expect to, to, to learn the overall effectiveness of the library session but I did think that it's an interesting way to sort of explore that idea and I made it in 22 minutes that's not bad Dr. Hall I don't really have anything else to say not bad at all and you actually um yeah I think that was perfect timing thank you Hunter so much um, so hold on one moment. Let me just get situated here. I'm gonna, okay. I'm going to stop sharing content. Oh, okay. Um, so we did have a question come up in the chat from Harry, um, and he wanted to know, have, uh, and maybe actually I'll let him go ahead and, and engage you. Oh, good. Dr. Price. Hello, Hunter. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, oh, thanks, sir. Yeah. So, you, you know, I, what? Your teaching this topic is really important, and I was just wondering, um, have you taught this in other classes? You say in the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, School of Music, oh, yeah. but specifically in College of Arts and Sciences, have you taught this to uh, students in STEM? Um, as of yet, just because I've only been here 19 months, uh, Grace mostly ha uh, helps the students with uh, who do STEM. Uh, those are just the classes that, that she has uh, sort of taken over um, just because you know, she's been here longer. She's instruction coordinator. I think she has a relationship with the professors. But I have done that and for classes in STEM in my previous university. Most of the ones that I've done at Stetson have been like political science, history, English, um, business. Gosh, I'm trying to think what else. So of course, the F sums, a few J sums. And, but we as librarians definitely present to STEM students, just FYI. It's just I haven't had that opportunity much, except for maybe the, an FSM class that I, I did. But, um, but again, I'm, I'm kind of like Grace's second on this. <laughs> uh, thank you, because, um, you know, I feel like I'm hiding under, I'm living under a rock, you know. Um, information literacy is, this kind of literacy is really, really critical. And I think, we try to do the best we can. I know I do with my students, but if there's some formal way uh, to route them into training or a course like this, I would love to have a conversation with you because uh, it would be really helpful, I think, to um, arrive at a standard curriculum, i.e. syllabus or some, some kind of learning uh, uh, map. Yeah, uh, Harry, I'm really glad you said that. As a matter of fact, the um, the QEP has taken on um, critical skills. You know what? Uh, I was on the core learning committee with Megan O'Neill and uh, a few others, and we are sort of trying to figure out how to get students, like you just said, through because uh, information literacy is a really important part of the Stetson general learning outcome. We're trying to get as many students as possible to go through this, to understand evaluating sources, to understand the importance of citing, the importance of research skills, the importance of using information ethically and effectively. And I think you're really right. We're trying to, uh, so I know that Grace would be interested in this and, and we can 
we can absolutely figure something out. I, I'm not exactly sure what she's taught in the STEM, but I do know she has done a bunch. But this has been uh, something that's really important to us is to get as many students on board up to a certain level as possible. And it's so weird because sometimes I'll teach seniors and they're like, oh, I wish I'd known this three years ago. And I'm like, oh, my God, we tried. I mean, it's just sometimes people fall through the cracks. They just, you know, again, there's only two librarians doing this and we're just like hustling. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, you know, but so. Um, but Harry, I really think that Grace, I know Grace and I would love to meet with you because uh, she has a, a lot of really good ideas. And, and it, we really want to help as many students as possible with this sort of skill building. information. Well, I'll try to reach out to you. Oh, great. Thank you. So much. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you listening. Yeah. I appreciate I you hearing you snore. I was so grateful for that. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Harry. And um, I had a question as I was listening to you. Actually, we're our sort of working life is overlapping in this one particular way. I'm uh, working on assessment uh, for the prison education project, and it's different from assessment in um, in our departments or in my department, at least, especially because it's hard to discover how effective we are. I think that we, you know, run into some limitations that may structurally be different from what you're dealing with when students walk in your door or walk in your virtual classroom, but, but they have some of the same outcomes, you know, like the engagements are sometimes limited, like, you know, we have like some of the problems with measurement. So I wanted to ask you a follow-up question about this proxy that you used of students feeling confident. So we are doing something similar in the community education project. We're doing these like feeling thermometers <laughs> about, you know, how confident they feel in engaging some of the skills that we're trying to teach. So like, um, for instance, we did this with writing. Um, they took a writing course at the beginning. We said, you know, how confident are you about communicating your message to your readers as a writer? Um, how confident are you that you can um, express yourself with limited um, uh, constraints like grammatical errors, you know? And then afterward, we asked the same questions. And so they're kind of these confidence intervals or something. So I wanted to know if you wanted to say more about, I mean, you mentioned that you think it's a good proxy for whether or not your curriculum is working, whether or not it's working. Um, were there other sort of things that you considered trying to measure? Or was this really just like, OK, this is the best practice. We'll ask them for their confidence level. And you know that's as close as we can kind of get. Or what was your thinking around that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so th just full disclosure, this is my first time. Uh, I have 20 years in libraries work, but I've never done a survey like this, a research study. And so I also ask them their comfort level and asking for help at the library. But here's the problem, and I have the data. I, you know, survey design is much more difficult than you think it is. Or excuse me, survey design is, is it's like a whole field in its own, you know. And so I didn't quite I asked some ambiguous. I used some ambiguous adverbs, and I'm a little embarrassed about it. But it's just something that I had to learn. As the results it, it showed that there were the responses were like they didn't exactly understand what I was talking about. What level of comfort? A hope was to address levels of comfort and confidence. And so the one thing that I thought was interesting about the confidence, and I'm really glad you asked about that, is even though they were really confident, I didn't find them overly so because at the end, and some of the survey questions I asked at the end, that really worked out that I didn't think were going to work out, or wasn't sure, they said how much they wanted to learn in addition to what they already learned. So even though they do report being confident, I wouldn't necessarily, some of the academic literature almost makes it sound like they're cocky. And I don't really agree with that because of what, of this 200, you know, 125 uh, students, you know, they seem like they're, 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 they're kind, of, kind of crave these opportunities to learn more, to understand how to improve their search strategies, understand uh, various levels of information and, and all that. So I, 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 I was a little, I was encouraged by that. So I did assess the comfort and I mean, there, I, you know, there was, it was interesting, but it, it ended up showing more of my sort of weak survey um, instrument. And it wasn't intentional. It was just one of those things that I had to learn. And I asked a whole lot of questions and I got some really good data. 
that point was not the worst, just being honest. <laughs> God bless uh, me. Bless my heart, as, I, as we say in the South. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. Survey instruments, so difficult to, there's always all kinds of little difficulties. And I think that when you're trying to figure out how exactly do I want to deliver this information, mm -hmm. um, is it is this the best way? Um, you know, right. it, it's, it's tough um, yes. you have to determine if it, you know how to measure that so I appreciate your answer uh, anyone else want to ask um, Hunter a question that prison project sounds really cool Melinda oh thank you yeah if you don't um, know about it, it's a faculty-led project community education project um, four of us faculty work on it and um, we normally outside of COVID times hold courses um, at Tomoka Correctional Institution, which is in Daytona Beach. Um, right now we're working with those students just in different ways. And then um, we're preparing to hopefully re-enter next year into the space um, in a limited way. Back in. 2021, so spring, you know? mm -hmm. good. Yeah, we're, they're giving us permission, but we're, it's, a little more complicated for us than just the simple permission. We're trying to be able to meet outside, for example, um, and things like that. So we'll see. Um, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, hoping for that. Cool. Any other uh, questions for Hunter? All right. Well, thank you very much for presenting uh, your work. And you know, I know I I tell my students to check out the. The, the guides, but I have much the same experience you do when I tell them like, oh, didn't you know that, you know, the library website can help you create citations or do this or do that. They're always like, what? what? Yeah, exactly. That's All the tools that we didn't have when I was in school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're here to make your lives easier. You know, that's what. Exactly. Exactly. And you, you so do. So thank you very much for everything that you do for the students and for your presentation. Thanks so much. Um, Yep, and thank you to the participants. Um, we will see you back again for spotlight sessions that are upcoming um, in November.